Stay in. Pull up. You have a brew, everybody. It is me, super fan Jeremy Cobb. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, We are here for another super fan chat, but it's not just me. I am joined by another super fan. Please say hi, super fan. Hi, super fan. I'm super fan Alice. Pronouns she, her. And uh, who, who are we joined by today, Jeremy? Oh, we are joined by a very, very special guest. Uh, we are joined <gasps> by, for the first ever time, one of the casts has, has crossed what? over into the super fan chat lounge that we have here. Because yes, we record these in a very expensive lounge, <laughs> uh, that we rent. <laughs> it is where all the Patreon money goes. <laughs> that's, that's where the budget goes. <laughs> all on the super fan chat. Uh, another lounge. mimosa, please. Uh, could I get another one? Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes, our personal butler is serving us drinks. <laughs> Thank Thank you, Jeeves. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, it's me, Grace Kelly Miller, who plays Gwendolyn. I, uh, my pronouns are she, her. And yeah, I have come and infiltrated Superfan Chats today. Um, it's been something we've been toying with for a while. And as there were only super, two Superfans available this week, I thought, well, why not come and join in? So um, I will, for this purposes, obviously, listeners, Obviously, I'm not going to come in with theories because I do know what's happening. So my main job is to try and not give anything away and have a poker face so Jeremy and Alice don't find out all the secrets. But what I will be doing is I will uh, read out the recaps and then Jeremy and Alice will have at it uh, with their points. Um, and it just means they can't say anything too mean about me because I'm here. <laughs> I had so many mean comments lined up. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. That's all I have written is specifically mean things about Grace. Grace is a big, smelly, poo-poo head. Grace sounds like she smells. <laughs> Um, yeah, so <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Like, uh, I'm also the useful thing about me having here is, um, I'm also one of the editors, so I listen to the episodes quite a lot, so I can verify some things. I hope I'm going to say this and then they're going to ask me a question and I'm going to be like, um, <laughs> I don't remember. Let me text Ben Galpin <laughs> or Pip. Um, <laughs> they are my go, or David, of course, as well, but you know. For context, Grace, I don't know if you if you feel comfortable saying, but what? How long ago did you all record these episodes versus when they were actually like released and when we're recording now? I guess. Uh yeah. Um, that's a really good question, Jeremy Cobb. Uh, I would say April. Okay. Maybe? Okay. So we're talking about like a four month gap. Yeah. Then, potentially. So it was th- these episodes are just after Ben has gone off to America, and he's mm-hmm. been back for a while now. Yeah, I, it could it could have it could be even further away. Um, so yeah, so it, it definitely like re-listening to them was definitely a bit of a like rejudge for me as well. Mm. And we are quite far ahead as well, so it's just like all a big like wibbly wobbly timey wimey uh, editing world that it is. So yeah, but I think on the whole, I should be able to kind of verify any facts. And you know, you can ask me some reasonable questions about the actual thing. I just. I need to yeah. be good and not like get involved with the theories because you know <laughs> that would be bad. So the the game for us is to read your poker face. Uh, I would just turn my screen off. <laughs> no. no, okay. You can <laughs> no, you can <laughs> you can try. My poker face is nowhere near as good as David Knight's. Alas, <laughs> <laughs> he's got an excellent poker face. He is a fortress. Honestly, yeah. when we have our, uh, I suppose this is an experience of like having the no small talks that we put out on Patreon and he will just sit there with this ex- blank expression. And mm. as we all like, you know, come up with our own theories of what could be going on at that particular point. So, um, yeah. yeah, but so this will be a serene a- stare. Serene <laughs> stare. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and be as serene as I can, but I'm very excited to be with you both. I just get to hang We're excited out. to have you. Yeah, lovely this is voice. cool. Yeah, lovely lounge. Margaritas yeah. are plenty. Mm-hmm. Smoking jackets as well. Nobody oh. even smokes in here. But yeah, we no, have no, smoking we've all jackets. got mo- monogrammed slippers as well. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. obviously. With oh, each yeah. of our in, in, uh, each of our initials. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's an offshoot of the Rambler's Rest, and this is the particular Super Fan Chats uh, lodge. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Should we jump on in uh, with episode, the summary of episode 30? 30, uh, 30? My God. 73? <laughs> 73. <laughs> All the way back to episode 30. Oh, my. What happened um, in episode 30? Oh, God. That's that a was, I that? think right after... I, I think it was right after I left. Yeah. I think it was like right after Dwayne. It's really close yeah. to like battle down the hatches and stuff like that. Yeah. I'll, I'll I look think it up when, at some point. <laughs> wasn't that the origin then of the Gaius being like, I have 10,000 gold pieces. <laughs> <Was that laughs> <the origin? laughs> yeah. I think no, it was that episode. <laughs> it's going to be really annoying. So I am just going to look now. <laughs> episode 30 was in the wake. Absolutely. You smashed it, Jeremy. Whoa. That was the origin of um, 10,000 gold. That's amazing. Yay. I'm very impressed. Thank you. I think you win super fan. I think you might. Thank you. <laughs> I think they come out with a bringing a crown out right now. Bring <laughs> 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 okie dokie so i shall uh read you all out a summary of episode 73 well having been teleported to kissing beck without the fifth member of the fake mark five the party contact Oren to gauge his safety as satisfied as they can be with his choice in air quotes for our listeners to help Petra for an unspecified time, the now averager lads take in their surroundings and spot the henge Petra mentioned on the horizon. After a quick flight over the Ferrigold tea fields, the party investigates the henge at the centre of the crops and discover a small well like hole in the middle of the nine stones. Ever curious, Juna polymorphs herself and Enkidu into frogs to explore the depths of the well. Unfortunately, the spell doesn't allow them to retain their usual presence of mind, and they go full frog. Some amphibian adventures later, the pair return to Gwendolyn and Gaius and find themselves magically revitalised. Realising that the waters within the Henge can replenish spell slots, somewhat like a fantasy energy drink dubbed Henge Bull by Juna. They utilise the effects of the water and the surrounding tea plants for a divination spell, asking of the possibilities of the Henge's power, if all of it were to be drawn. The plants respond with an eruption of growth, covering the stones and nestling the party in a boundless bush. With the further confirmation of the power of the Henge's, the party make use of the water once again with some sending spells, though Juna is aware that this newfound energy may not last. The party contact Kasula and request she look after their horses Pip and Lord Crumpet after they'd left them behind in Fallos Vale. And they also procure some advice from a bison riding ginger that folk tales may be a useful source in their continued search for information on the origin of the Henges. With the early morning approaching and the comfy and cosy new plant growth around them, the party finally settle down for a night's sleep. I'll I'll jump in first and say I really I I want to commend the team uh for the way that you all handled Ben's absence because obviously whenever you do a series like this that is taking place over a very long period of time life is going to get in the way uh and this is one of the best instances I think of it just feel like if you didn't know that it was happening you might be like oh no this <laughs> the the treacherous un, unbodied person has taken Horrid away uh and what what's happening like it's it, it's a it feels like a genuine cliffhanger yeah. with the previous episode and then this episode it's like, oh, okay. I guess, well, I guess we have to keep going. Like, it. I really liked that. Yeah. Uh, what did you think, Alice? Oh, I, I loved it. And I, it was so funny with the last episode. I got so stressed out thinking, oh, no, she's taken Orin. And then realized what you'd done. I, I, the story was so good that I'd forgotten that it was a real life mechanic. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then it was so reassuring getting that message from him at the beginning of the episode and knowing that Orin's having a nice time as well as Ben touring the states so yeah there was it was a it was really well handled yeah completely yeah 
And also, I want to commend you all for not just the edited in audio from Ben in this particular episode, but the when, whenever you've done it in past episodes, because I, I would call that just using the medium to your advantage. Yeah. You, you're using a pre-recorded audio medium. Why not just go to people and be like, yeah, could you record this thing yeah. uh, and just play it? And it's it always is great. So I love yeah, that. Yeah, it was a yeah. particular highlight when you did the message replying to, to Gwen. That was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's really fun, like, when you're kind of hiding that sort of thing from the rest of the cast. Like, <laughs> I, I certainly, like, uh, when I had Jeremy at the ready to be like, look, we've got a reply already. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was really fun. Like, me me and Vicky had, like, been like, oh, yeah, we could say this and we could record like this. And I so I just know that Vicky would have just been really excited knowing that she had, you know, Ben ready in the pocket to be like, here's a message from Orin back. <laughs> And it was nice because, like, obviously we were already missing him. Yeah. And then it was just like, oh, there he is. There's our boy. Uh, I think that the – I think even what you just expressed, Grace, is kind of uh, – is one of the strengths uh, further of this podcast, I think, uh, is the friendship between you all as people. I think that, like, that creates – if I was going to describe, like, the tone of the podcast, I would say it has a very warm tone. Yes. Uh, and I think that a lot of that really comes through with the, the warm feelings that you all have, but like for each other and the, the warm, uh, relationship, the warm atmosphere that you cultivate as a group between, uh, between yourselves. I think that really comes through, even if the characters are maybe not feeling great or upset at each other. Uh, I think it really, it it really sets a great tone. (laughs) That's lovely. Oh gosh, you guys aren't bullying me at all. This is lovely. Don't worry, it's coming. <laughs> I do want to, uh, just to say, like, the, the, the smoothness of, um, kind of working it into the story it was like, it was, helped so much that Ben had told us ages ago. But like, David had, I think he had so many different possibilities mm. for the way he was going to have Ben leave us or have Orin leave us. All that kudos is, is all down to David and his wonderful mind. Yeah. Mm. He is a clever man. Uh, shout out to Baby David. Yeah. He is. Absolutely. Um, I also, I want to say I love the imagery of Enkidu flying through the air, carrying <laughs> Kai, Gwendolyn, and Judah. <laughs> That's such just like a weird, like, this really tall half-orc woman just balanced <laughs> on his back as he's, like, carrying an elderly gnome. And then I'm not even sure where Guy was positioned in that group. Well, I think Guy was flying separately, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So Guy was the- carrying Juna. Basically, they'd both gone off and they were just, like, leaving us behind. <laughs> um, and then yeah the there was definitely the awkwardness of Gwendolyn and Enkidu like oh okay gonna carry me sure whatever. it took me such a long time to work out the sticks because I did not picture them flying upright I was sort of picturing them flying that way uh, like Superman and then mm. you actually like riding on his back yeah and and so then finding out that you were doing a piggyback was so weird. Just it is so it's such a long image <laughs> to be flying with. Yeah, and I thought that Guy, Juno, and Ruana were That's full amazing. Studio Ghibli. Oh my goodness, <laughs> yes. Kiki's delivery service. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just love like you know Juno and Guy having a full on gossip about finally hearing about what happened. Yeah. <laughs> With the boys uh, <laughs> and the dragon and ev- the pastry dragon and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's always really fun to play on those different dynamics between the team, and it but it's also weird getting used to the dynamics without Orin. Yeah. As well, mm. like it's like, oh wait a minute, how's this gonna work with four of us? Well, mainly just no mm. investigation checks. <laughs> no investigation checks. Nobody rolled above <laughs> ten in this episode. It was bad. <laughs> and in no uh no flash of genius either no like you don't have you don't have ben like smiling at baby david with his finger hovering over the button just being like i can make that a i can add a plus five to that at any given moment although i do think there was above oh, a 10 yeah. and it was daryl rolling for whether enkidu gave away the secrets of the night you separated and it was completely mm-hmm. pointless because guy was there <laughs> <laughs> Like, look at me being all smooth. <laughs> Guys going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And then this happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, another thing that jumped out to me, the idea of Juna being uh, kinky and into porn cracked me up. I don't know what it is. It was just like... <laughs> 
<laughs> just bringing that out was it, that gnome is filth <laughs> i love that as a piece of character development i mean she is <laughs> yeah. isn't she like she's lived a life yeah i i feel like you don't end up with that many tattoos at her age unless you've had some fun mm-hmm. yeah yeah i feel like juna had an entirely separate like level one to 20 adventure (laughs) way back in the day and then like just took some time off sort of let everything atrophy back down and is now going on another one yeah she did like 50 years looking after the roses just like you know incognito seeing Mm -hmm. where she needs to be and then back on an adventure about time it's weird thinking of her being that static now we've met her for this Mm. amount of time yeah, it's like yeah. she's just kind of in like sleeper mode almost. Yes. And then it's just like, right, I'm off now. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, because she, d- she really does seem like a very active person. Yeah. Like a very active and energetic person. So yeah. it's odd to think of her not yeah. being, not expressing that through her whole life. Yeah. I mean, certainly she she did plenty of work at the Roses. Like she was like the chef, but also like, you know, there's three kids running around and uh, Gwendolyn was a pain in the ass so um <laughs> she had pl- she sh- she had plenty on her hands like especially until Kasula turned up there was no real mother figure in the house either so that's quite a few years with two young girls who got into everything and a father who was going off on business a lot mm-hmm. so i think even though she wasn't off adventuring she was definitely uh she was busy busy lady was uh Juna just in a more yeah homestead uh environment yeah yeah i guess the active the active part was having to take care of like some super energetic kids yeah who are getting into all sorts of mischief <laughs> uh for years they're probably end. really good at making like booby uh, traps and uh oh yeah <laughs> escape scenarios well she was so yeah. she's there for 50 years so she was also looking after sealerman which is the dad and so mm-hmm. it, through his childhood and she, he's like you know the starter of this business and inventor so yeah they're I mean, all the things that he must have tested out. It's like Home Alone. Yeah. <laughs> she's she's like the wet bandits or whatever they're called in that movie. Just having to like fight through a, a, an absolute like barrage of horrifying traps that, that, yeah. that Gwen's dad has created. Juna, check out my dragon. It does fire. Uh, <laughs> she's just trying to get on with making the food. <laughs> I I also really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, where they were cycling through all the different animal options. Because I was like, oh, this is actually really interesting. Like, listening to the different, like, oh, yeah, okay, we could be dragonflies. That's true. Yeah. We could fly. Yeah, okay. Uh, or, but we could we could do something that's like a fish and see if we have to breathe. Oh, that's true. Like, I, I don't know. Something about that, like, hearing that conversation, I was, I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I wonder. Maybe they could be mm-hmm. otters. Well, but then they have to follow yeah. that way. Uh, so, settling on frogs uh, was a fun one. It was the smartest choice. I was sad no one mentioned penguins, but yes, frogs was a good choice. Better than dragonflies. Mm. Yes, I agree. Less likely, to, perhaps less likely to get eaten. Yeah. Um. Do do we have confirmation of whether penguins exist in this world? Oh, maybe no one's ever seen a penguin. Oh my God, the sadness. <laughs> Somebody call David. <laughs> David, there have to be penguins. <laughs> or even uh, Orin, because I imagine like Woden Isles is more likely where you're going to find penguins. Yeah, that makes sense. Colder climate. Mm. But I feel like everyone on the Woden Islands would have killed and eaten them hundreds of years ago. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Penguins are pretty chill. Like, I, I seem to recall stories of when people went to Antarctica, they would just sort of pick them up. Because <laughs> yeah. like, the penguins didn't know what a human was. So they're like, oh, hey, man. <laughs> they just come over and grab a penguin. And then oh. its, fr- its friends would never see it again. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Bill? Uh, he went off with those new guys. <laughs> oh, man. <Aww>. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how Oren saw penguins. <laughs> he was a researcher who, used to, who grew up eating penguin. Uh, <laughs> Delicacy in the Woden Isle. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, also, the the uh, the idea that they are now mentally frogs. Yeah. Uh, I was I knew like as a DM <laughs> sitting there, I can imagine that David sitting there would be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, no, realizing like wondering if you guys were gonna think of like, hey, would we still be able to? Because that is a big thing with polymorph is that you're just now that animal. You're not you're not able to behave like yourself anymore. Uh, so that was yeah, really I um 
I'd messaged to David because there's there's a moment where it happens in the second season of Critical Role and they turn into moths and then they're just like, oh, now I'm just a moth chewing on a curtain for an hour. <laughs> Like, <laughs> like, look. So I just like had, had privately messaged David and going, "Is this going to be like the moths?" And he was just like, "Yes, it is." And I was just like, "I'm," I was just like, "I'm keeping my mouth shut because I want to see how these two react to that happening." And I, it was so worth it. Yeah, it was absolute gold. Like, just especially the combination of Juna and um, Enkidu doing that, and then like the way Daryl was just so dryly just adding ribbit. Into <laughs> he really got inside the mind of a frog he really did <laughs> kudos to D- daryl it's an un- unknown talent yeah. <laughs> the tattooed frog uh was also a lovely touch and uh the scimitar yeah was it was it a real tiny scimitar or was it sort of markings like a scimitar i feel like the idea of it was that it was a genuine just like a mini scimitar <laughs> the frog just has a sword yeah. it's so cute <laughs> <laughs> just a heavily tattooed elderly frog and then like an angsty sort of brooding armed frog <laughs> sharing a worm yeah that's also a combo the, what a, one of the things I love about it is when we get to see like unusual combos of characters and I feel like mm-hmm. Enkidu and Juna is not one that we get to see a lot Certainly not having japes. I feel like mm. no deep conversations, maybe mm. like a fireside. Because yeah. Juno's a very good person to have a, a deep conversation with. She's got all those mm. ears. Yeah, and Enkidu is so respectful mm. of her. Like especially when they first met, he was so sort of a deferent almost. Mm. So him having fun with Juno is a really fun combo. I agree. And Kida needs to chill out more. Have more fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like he's got loads of people in his head and it's really serious or something. It's like he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, well, I wonder what he was like before he had a bunch of people inside of his head. Mm. Like, is you know what I mean? Because we don't get to see the the other side of him. We only see, like, him having had this possibly tragic backstory. We don't really know all the details. <laughs> uh, but ha- after having had, like, this seemingly very difficult and dark backstory that he now has all these people in his head, we don't really, we don't see the pre- uh, the pre backstory in Kidu, where he may have just been like some fun dude who was like, "Yeah, I love to laugh. I love to. I love to go out for a nice jape." Uh, he was like an aspiring stand up comedian or bard or something. Like before all this happened. Yes, I mean we know he broke into brothels and also a palace. So that that sounds like japes, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just having a oh. laugh yeah. as you do break it into a palace. <laughs> Um, also, the growth of the plants, in contrast to the uh, the withering of the plants, when Juno was casting divination, I found that really interesting. It was so cool. It yeah. was such a nice image. Well, I was wondering also if it had it, like, at first, I was like, is this some indication about whether she's one of the good petals or the bad petals? Because, like, last oh. time, it's like, oh, they're withering. Oh, no. Is that potentially pr- even loosely tied to, like... What, what kind of petal she is and then when they're growing it's like oh could it be that she's like the one in the middle is that what this is an indication of and then david was like well it's an indication that the magic if you if you uh engage with this like if if it what is it if you unleash the magic of this place then like there's growth that would happen i mm. think is what he was kind of saying uh but still you never know yeah that's a really cool thought yes Grace has adopted the serene stone face. Oh, yeah, there she is. <laughs> I just realised I was chatting a lot, and I was just like, I need to let you two just do your thing and listen. So I'm glad I'm glad it's coming across as serene. I'm glad. Yes. <laughs> it was so serene. Mm-hmm. Mm. I felt very calm just looking at you, oh, actually. You are so welcome. <laughs> just a, a soothing face. So with divination, do flowers like normally wither as you kind of take the goodness out of them? Is that sort of why that went like that? Or is it? very specific to juna the flower thing i think it's i think it's specific to juna the uh, the spell itself does not really mention flowers it is essentially that you ask i think it's like you ask a a higher power of some kind uh, about an event that is going to happen within the next seven days uh or could happen within the next seven days i guess and it will answer you in some way that may be cryptic 
I don't think it's usually meant to be inaccurate. I think it's usually, let me look at the exact language of the spell. Your magic and an offering put you in contact with a god or a god's servants. You ask a single question concerning a specific goal, event, or activity to occur within seven days. The GM offers a truthful reply. The reply might be a short phrase, a cryptic rhyme, or an omen. This would have been an omen, I think would be the best way to describe it. Uh, the spell doesn't take into account any possible circumstances that might change the outcome, such as the casting of additional spells or the loss or gain of a companion. And then there's a 25% chance that the reading is random if you cast the spell more than once before your long rest, uh, your next long rest, but that wasn't the case here. So no. it may have been that it manifested in the way that it did because it was Juna casting the spell and because she has that. That was what I was thinking. Uh, was that it was manifesting the way it did because it was colored by Juna's specific magic. Yeah. Yeah. If we do choose to interpret it like that, as well as the Henge also enacting, we still don't know what Juna is, whether she's good, no, dark, light, or neutral. Mm -hmm. Although one on, one off does imply balance, right? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know if that's the, if that was meant as an indication of that, or if it was just the omen itself, or if it's possibly both. <laughs> Sorry, I did a face which is not great for audio. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good face. They though. both did fantastic faces, <laughs> listeners. They were very curious faces, and really mm. drew me in as a as a viewer. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm also like, I'm wondering, is the party going to go back and try and snag some of this water? Because sure, the water when it, when you come down off the water, it can be pretty rough, but the initial like, take a shot. Just a quick shot of the water. And how much, like, would that restore any, any, uh, uh, spell slots? You know what I mean? Little yeah. five hour energy, like, like on the go. I, I think they did try and fill up some, like, drinking things, didn't you? Yeah, th they filled up some water skins. So there we go. Oh, uh, were those taken from you, though? Uh, when, did they, did they leave you those when you, when security picked you up? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, talking of security, shall uh, we move <laughs> into the next uh, oh, episode? Yes. What a segue. Uh, not that it's in my recap, but yeah, they the, the party's stuff wasn't touched, like other than it was carried, but they were, nothing was like confiscated or anything. Right. So security was okay with you stealing their magic water. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose because it's not really a limited supply there. Mm. So it's just kind of flowing. Maybe they just thought it was water and they didn't do like the festival thing where they smell it to check yeah. it's vodka. Or Maybe they don't even know. Oh. <laughs> Who knows? Because they didn't yeah, like, know a... why they were all asleep. That's a good point. That's a good point. So maybe they don't know that that's what it can do. Yeah. But let me uh, let me give a little recap to <laughs> episode 74, Talk of the Town. With the entirety of the party having succumbed to sleep at the Henge, they awake in rather different surroundings, as we were just mentioning. Gwendolyn, having drunk the least of the Henge Bowl, being the first to wake in the very cold tea infirmary. Well rested but perplexed, the Abrica lads are greeted by Dr. Humbert Mattis, who informs them that they've been asleep for the past two days. As they reel from the loss of time, they reluctantly sign legal documents, absolving the Ferry Cold Tea Company and its estate from any responsibility regarding what had happened to them. Leaving with tea-filled goodie bags in hand, it became clear that their long nap had become something of the talk of the town which was now in full festival flow to celebrate the end of the Twain Tide Tea Tournament. The Abrica lads secured lodgings in a cramped room at the Swan Inn before heading out in search of folk tales. Juna traded the story of Fox Koi Blossom with a stable hand named Kosh, who shared a story of the local henge and sold them four horses for the journey to come. In search of more legends, they made their way through the reveling crowds, catching a glimpse of the winning team, the Shattered Rooms, a quintet of orcish ladies banqueting in pride of place on a stage. Heading into a tavern for some strawberry daiquiri refreshments, the party were approached by Eustace Hograthian, who made a wager with Guy as to who could tell the best story. On declaring himself the winner, the charming dwarven bard asked the Fate Mark IV if they would help him get his job back. A very effective. I'm loving these recaps. These, <laughs> oh, these recaps are excellent. Lovely. 
so much of them have stolen from David, but some of it's me. <laughs> well, Alice, what are your initial thoughts on this episode? I did want to know a little bit more about the tea dreams. I wanted to know whether these were real people, whether they went into sort of um, uh, other world where they sort of met characters who might be important later or just like parallel universe friends. Um, like maybe they would be on this quest with those people in another mm. universe or something. I thought that was there was just something really uh, fun and intriguing about that whole idea. Yeah, I completely agree. I thought especially given that yeah. David actually let the, the cast describe who the people were uh and i like yeah i'm wondering how what the significance of that is and uh the yeah specifically like the tea dream it almost reminds me of weirdly <laughs> of um 2001 a space odyssey like the ending when he's suddenly just in a hotel <laughs> like he goes through the stargate and he's just like in a ho he's like in this nice hotel like oh I'm just chilling. It's like you drink uh, drink some of this magic water, pass out, and suddenly you're just having tea with somebody. And this person, I the way I almost interpreted it is like the person who showed up may have been real in some sense, but also like was almost created from the the person who was dreaming. That was how it almost felt. Like by having the, the players make it up, it felt like, oh yeah, this is the person that you feel would be sitting across from your character having tea. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah, just um, their perfect tea friend uh, in that their mind made. I love that. Yeah, that's really cool. I do worry about Guy mm. being in like a grove of skeletons drinking tea. Right? <laughs> yeah. Was... And now what, what are they just pouring the tea in? It's just <laughs> yeah. blah, 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 like it's Pirates of the Caribbean just <laughs> running through the bones. Yeah, it's a really creepy image. And then just this ginger having a nice time with him. Different ginger. This is a redhead. I mean, I just say that I am a ginger. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Juna, Juna's tea dream companion, I believe, was a gnome woman. Yes. Uh, and Kidu's was a half orc warrior woman, and and he also said that he didn't know her name. Like when he woke up, another shout out to Daryl with his performance. Uh, wake up, like wait, but you didn't tell me your name. Yeah, that was so great. Yeah. Uh, and then Gwen's was Uncle Iro as a gnome. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me being silly most of the time. <laughs> before, before you had said that it was Uncle Iroh, and you were like, it's an old man. I was like, okay. And you're surrounded by white lotuses. And I'm like, oh, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, and there was like one or two other things you said where I was like, wait a minute. Uh, I really liked that. That was cute. That is exactly the desired effect. I just love Uncle Iroh. He's one of my favorite characters in Avatar. And so I was just like, I know who I want to have tea with. Aww. Honestly, yeah, he's a great character. He's incredibly wholesome. Mm -hmm. Apart from like all the people like probably died when he was like leading an army, but you know, yes, he had an un he was a wholesome man with an unwholesome past. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we've all got our skeletons. So is Guy. <laughs> guy's, <laughs> guy's having tea with it. <laughs> also, the two full days of sleeping. Mm -hmm. I always love that in fantasy, when people wake up and everyone goes, oh, you've been asleep for two days, but you're better now. Um, I, I always really mm. enjoy it because I'm like, I don't think I could. I struggle to stay asleep past 10 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, if you're magically enchanted, maybe that helps. I need to find me a henge. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna sleep till two. You'll, you'll have a really productive day, and then you'll just sleep for ages. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> as long as you know what's going on. Yeah, it was maybe not the best idea for all of us, but we, you know, we got a lot of admin done. <laughs> gonna call this person, call that person. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I, I was gonna say also, it reminded me of Rip Van Winkle, which oh, is yeah. a famous American story, uh, in which a dude, uh, he went, he basically, I, I think he was hunting and in the mountains, and he came across a bowling game that sounded like thunder with these strange giant men, uh, bowling. They were bowling in the middle of the forest, and the sound of the bowling pins was like thunder. And he's like, wow, that's wild. And then he fell asleep under a tree. I think he drank with them afterwards, and he fell asleep under a tree and woke up like 20-something years later. Uh, and he like woke up, he had a really long beard, his musket was like completely rusted through and overgrown. He went back to the town, and everybody thought he was dead. Uh, his kids were grown up. It was wild, and it reminded me a little bit of that. Obviously, it was not nearly as long of a time skip. But uh, it uh, it is interesting, like, whatever, in the same way, Alice, I love it when people fall asleep like that for a really long time. Then it's like, oh, what all happened? <laughs>
did we specify or did we ever clarify how uh, security knew y'all's names? Yeah, no. Uh, so they they found uh, that they were a part of the T tournament and worked out that they were the Abrica lads. Oh. Yeah, no, you had your stickers on you. That was what it was, wasn't it? I think that in my head, I imagine them as being like um, like craft stamps. So oh, like yeah, they've course. got it car, they've got the image carved in, and then you like put it in the ink, and then yeah. it stamps. Mm. So they each had an, in- and they're all individual. So they had those, and they could use, as you very rightly said, Alice, to identify that they were indeed the Abracalants. Now I think uh, there's something like that when you go to Japan, like you can go to different cities and get a different stamp per city. It's really cool. Oh, yeah, I didn't do very well. I think I got like three, but worth it. Oh. <laughs> Um, I wonder if that was in any way an inspiration for the badge system in Pokemon, because I know that like, this, I know that the Spoon Quest was kind of inspired by the Pokemon games going around and getting badges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if like the stamp system, because in Pokemon you have to go around to different cities, defeat the gym leader there, and then you get the badge, and that shows that you've been to that oh. city and defeated that gym leader. So I'm wondering if that is in any way related. That's cool. I mean, it's way less effort in real life. You just go somewhere and find the place that has the stamps. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I love also the Twain Tide tournament ended while you all were asleep. (laughs) (laughs) And without Orin. I know. Yes. That's the harshest blow. I know it's probably an unpopular opinion. But I, I'm so gutted because I love the train tide competition so much. I wanted you to get all the spoons. I wanted to do the duck hunt, like even though you were wanted as criminals in the. I wanted you to do the duck hunt. I was so sad. <laughs> I am sad we didn't get to do the duck hunt. The uh, yeah, the hex uh, probably wouldn't have allowed us to finish that off before yeah. we left. They're so mean. They are. Yeah. I mean, that would be amazing if, like, David would do. A little spin-off of just like a, following a different team. The rat juggling team. They could do it. I love those guys. Yeah. They're pretty cool. I was looking for I was looking forward to the climax of the Twain Tide T tournament arc. Like <laughs> and, and then it was like, oh sorry. It ended I'm curious actually what David had planned for that, had you all not fallen asleep for two days. Yeah. Probably just a disappointing handing your card in and you, them going, You've only got three, why are you even competing? <laughs> <laughs> You are not going to win. The Abrica Sands. <laughs> the Abrica Sands. <laughs> oh. oh, it's funny because it's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also love that you all were celebrities throughout this time. <laughs> there, but he's yeah. like, oh, who was it? Who woke up first? That was such a good running gag. It was funny every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It legitimately was every single time. I also love that uh, Juna is such like... She is so willing to spy on people and like read people's minds and do what else. But we've, she has in two episodes used scrying twice now. Uh, she is detect thoughtsing people everywhere, <laughs> insight checking everyone. Uh, it's, it's a very fun trait. Uh, yeah. and also the things that we've learned from the scrying mm-hmm. have been really interesting. Like without Juna having scry. There's so much that we'd still be in the dark about. That's true. She's really helping us to keep an eye on what's going on around us. Like, I think she's she's getting a very particular set of skills. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's Arjuna. And she's really, you know, she, she's all the intel, all the admin. Cool, we'd be lost without all those skills that she has. Yeah, even polymorph. Even yeah. polymorph. <laughs> Somebody's got to turn into a frog. Yeah, she's your gnome. <laughs> honestly one of my favorite times ever (laughs) david did the best giggle during that whole session it was sort of it was slightly evil (laughs) and just slightly knowing but also someone just full of joy that this was happening at all yeah i love that giggle so much yeah (laughs) i think he just loves it so much when we also back ourselves into a really (laughs) stupid situation (laughs) it's like it's just like going back to the whole we're in tomorrow moment whenever i listen like back to him just being like Yep, still looks exactly the same outside. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that whole sequence was so ridiculous. I just think that's just the beginning of like, yeah, that no, that that those knowing yeps from David. Mm-hmm. Very much just like, oh, okay. <laughs> And and what you're saying, Grace, is really is, is also very true about like Judah being really key to things. Because for all of like the lightheartedness and warmth, this is a very intrigue heavy campaign. 
Mm. Like it's a lot of politics, like a lot of skullduggery and treachery and mystery. Uh, and even though like the, the party has like a, a real warmth that they bring with them, the world is like, Everyone has secrets, and there are conspiracies all over the place, and everyone is is part of three different separate uh, organizations, all of which are fighting each other. And it's like, oh my goodness, which is great. It, it's part of why scrying is such a useful spell, and, and detect thoughts are such useful useful spells in this campaign in particular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think June has said it specifically. She was like, I just don't trust anyone anymore. Because like post Heron, she's very she's definitely taken a step back in how trusting she is with people. Yeah, I mean she'll go out and find someone to have a chat to still, but she will insight check them immediately. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and this in speaking as somebody who was insight checked by Juna, uh, or not even insight checked, not just insight checked, <laughs> mind read by Juna. She wasn't super trusting even before. No. But yeah, the also I love the implication, or at least the little theory, that the magic that unbodied Petra may be the same as that which stored in Kidu's friends in his body. That was cool. Yeah. So do you reckon that means that... Oh man, I've forgotten who it is. Who's the the person that's inside Petra? The arcanist... Oh, uh, Char- Chargelt. Chargelt! Yes. Of course, there's a hall named after them. Yeah, them. Yeah. Uh, so there's a possibility that they were at the battlefield, like, making this stuff happen, potentially, as sort of the arch arcanist, archmagus type person. Maybe they were there. That would be quite a fun thing for them to investigate if they didn't have, like, a million other things on. Mm, that's a good theory. Yeah. Mm. Like this game this campaign literally could go on for like another year plus. Oh my god. Because of just how many years, in fact. Just because of how many different like threads and storylines that can be like it's I feel like it's unusual. Maybe it's just for me for the campaigns I've played in, but I feel like for a campaign to have gone this long and people's backstories and in some cases subclasses <laughs> to still be a mystery. <laughs> like I still don't know what subclasses Orin or Guy are. I just know that they're both, I just know they're an artificer and a bard. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> I think there might, I think there might be a Guy's subclasses on the Patreon. I, I do think Guy's subclass has been revealed because I think there was a. I need to go back onto the Patreon. <laughs> there, were, there was a chat where they went into it in detail. Can I remember what it is? I didn't write it down. It might have, it might have, some stuff might have come up in a no small question. Yeah, that's where I think I remember them saying, but I didn't write it down. It might be hidden somewhere from you, Jeremy. Is he roguey? Oh! oh. Is he a little roguey? I'm going to go onto the Patreon and have to listen to ev- all of the different, <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to all the Patreon content <laughs> and just find the one moment. Ah. Oh. And it's one of the subclasses that, so like the, David's written the um, Way of Decorum subclass for Gwendolyn. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there's a bard subclass. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but I think I'm pretty sure that's what Guy is. Mm. But also Guy is, and I think he has said this, so I think I'm allowed to say this, but Guy is built like a rogue. Yep. But then is a bard because of his past. So that's yeah. I think that's why he's such a like, what? <laughs> Yeah, like he's tough to he's tough to get a read on that way because mm. mechanically, yeah, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, he's not built to be what he is. Yeah, exactly. Which I think is just a great choice from mm. Chris to just be like, I'm gonna just do this thing that is gonna completely be a pain in the ass <laughs> sometimes. Uh, well, certainly early on with this character that is completely charisma based, and I'm just being like, nope, don't have it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, have we learned Orin's backstory, though? We've got bits of Orin's backstory, but, like, there's lots of personal yeah. information, I think, that Orin we don't know. Like, we know, yeah. you know, where he grew up and that sort of thing, and that he's looking for his parents, and that um, he had his no mentor. But there's certainly pers- feelings and personal stuff, I think, it, Orin does hold very close to his chest. The soldier mm. is still a mystery. Yeah. Though we did have him message people just before Petra took over his body. Yeah. I think that's really the closest we've had. There wasn't like true, a name. Yeah. It was just the the feelings were expressed, right? Was there a name? I think there was a name. And 
I want to say off the top of my head, I'm saying Florian, and I just might be making that up. Ooh, no, that does ring a bell. But it also could just be from something else that has a character <laughs> called Florian in. Um, but maybe I've been watching recently. Who knows? I oh, I also wanted to throw out you all renting more horses. The horse, oh, yeah. the horse <laughs> story continues. We had Bessie, <laughs> R.I.P. Oh. Uh, we've now have uh, Pip and Lord Crumpet. And now we're adding four more horses. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they fully own them now, though. Like, this isn't any stolen horse business. This is, That's this true. Is, they own this. This is bought with our own stolen money. <laughs> yeah, well done, you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and Kidus is Clanius, yeah. right? That's his name, Clanius? Uh, Clanius. And there was uh, a really good backstory, right? Because it's Alcibiades' father. That was cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was, it actually leads me to the next thing I was going to say. It's all the little love, uh, not love kernels, my goodness. The lore kernels that get dropped, uh, through this series. Uh, like the, like the bits of like, oh, this was Alcibiades dad. And it's like, oh, there's like a whole story. It sounds like there's an entire story and adventure that took place there. And I was like, dang. And then, um, the, the Fox Koi Blossom game. I was mm. like, oh, this is great. Oh, I love that. Yes. The story of the rivers, like all of these little bits where it's like, whoa, we're just throwing this in for some flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Like David wrote some beautiful, like he had, because he obviously as Juna, uh, as Ginger had said, oh, go find some folk tales. <laughs> that means he's got to write folk tales for us to go find. <laughs> but uh, Vicky did the Fox Koi Blossom, right? Or did. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah. 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 No, that's Vicky. That's a really fun thing to have. She did a great job. Yeah, she's had that one up her sleeve for quite a while. I think even actually since the oh. beginning of the campaign, because she sent me some videos of the different hand signals, because of course, Gwendolyn and Juna will have played that, mm. you know, that would have been a game that she'd played growing up with Juna. So it was important that I knew it for the backstory. I was at the bus stop doing the hand gestures. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Blossom is my favourite. It's fun. I think she said it was like Joey doing fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Listeners, we are all uh, doing the Blossom action right now. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I've never seen that episode. I've barely seen any of Friends, but I've never, but I still was like, I wonder if, from what I know of the character of Joey, how would he do? And this was literally what I had imagined that he was doing. Uh, but did you have any other thoughts about this episode, Alice? Uh, it was mainly, mainly sadness about the tea competition being closed. And then intrigue at the end with meeting Eustace and that fantastic sort of drop to the next episode with the, can you help me get my job back? That was great. Really smart. Well, shall we shall we get to know the next episode a little bit more? Let's find out a bit more about Why Eustace. Not? Why not? Okay. So episode 75, Shattered Tales. Eustace Hograthian had been bumped from his gig in favour of a flashier troop named Duck Duck Bard and was keen to find help to get his job back. As Guy and Juna suggested a show with the Abraka lads and uh, the winning team Shattered Runes, Enkidu headed off in search of intel regarding the next leg of their journey. In hopes of befriending the Shattered Runes and getting them to join in with the plan, Gwendolyn approached the team with a gift of strawberry daiquiris. However... On being announced with the name she signed up to the tournament with, Carhilda, the Orcosian members of the team reacted coldly, with one even leaving the stage. When confronted, the woman rounded on Gwendolyn, demanding that she stay away, calling her an omen of danger, death and disaster. Shattered by these words, Gwen ran to the edge of town in distress, while Juna, who had been watching the interaction from afar, cast detect thoughts on the Orcosian woman and saw childhood songs, games and tales about the myth of Carhilda, a warrior-like figure being overcome by a calamity. On finding the shaken Gwen, Juna and Guy took her back to the Swan Inn to rest and process this new information. Eustace soon arrived to cheer them up and learn what had actually happened. The group decided to drink, dance and kiss the rest of the night away. Returning drunkenly to the inn, the two bards chose to go off on a little walk together and play a secluded duet. That is an interesting way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a saucy time. It was. 
Mm. I mean, even the introduction, you you guys were just falling over each other to flirt with him. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> we just like because uh, Daryl wasn't there for the episode, and I think uh, the rest of us are so like. I mean, me and Vicky are by far the like naughtiest. Uh, we make the naughtiest jokes of the cast, um, but then you know Chris comes in a close second. <laughs> so kind of like the, the the filthiest minds were left to be in the podcast for an episode. <laughs> the two people who ground the whole thing yeah. were gone. <laughs> we lost our ankles. Oh no! It was one of my favourite things that you've said as Grace. Uh, I think in the episode was when uh, Enkidu walked off and he went, "He's not fond. Of, he's not fond of side quests." Uh, and that was really funny. <laughs> Yeah, I put that right in there for Daryl. <laughs> I thought he'd appreciate that when he heard it. <laughs> it's true, though. He's he's very much like, a, I'm getting the quest done. Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, well, you're like, let's help this random bard guy get his job back while also maybe hitting on him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, like, uh, unfortunately, Daryl couldn't be with us for that episode, but it just made so much sense for Aikido to just be mm-hmm. like, I'm out. Um, I'm going <laughs> to... Just make sure we're ready for tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Mm. I don't want to be a part of this, whatever this is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, the team up. I love the team up. Uh, oh, but before I say this, the I wanted to. Th- I I realized I never mentioned that the last episode there was so much bush. Uh, and I'm in favor of it. <laughs> I'm in favor of all the bush that we've had in the last two episodes. Um, yeah. but, so much. Bush. But now. Yes, I'm going to leave the bush behind, though, and talk about the team-up uh, with the Shattered Runes uh, to help, try and help Eustace get his job back. Because that really kicks off, like, I, I don't know uh, what David had in his plans, but I thought that was a great idea. Because we've heard their name multiple times. It's like, who are these people who won? Again, going back to Pokemon, it reminds me of when uh, you would see the people who won the Pokemon League. And you would they wouldn't show their faces. They would show their silhouettes. Mm. And to this day, like, I'm not even sure if we've met the people who won, like, the Indigo League way back in season one. We just saw their silhouettes. And it's like, oh, who was it? Uh, <laughs> and s- that was how it felt to me when they're, like, the Shattered Runes. I saw them standing on a podium. And I'm like, oh, just in silhouette. And I'm like, oh, yeah. man. And it led to so much. Yeah, it really derailed the side quest, really. Because, like, we did not care about Eustace's job as soon as we found out that all of this, I mean, that was a law drop. That was huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Playing Gwendolyn in that episode was, like, I, we were all crying. Like, it was emotional. It was, a, it was a properly emotional one. It was beautiful. Yeah. Like, each step along the way of the revelation, like... Oh, we're using the name Kahilda and the initial. By the way, is Kahilda in this case spelled C A H I L D A or C A R H? Is it Carhilda? I spelled it with a Kahilda? K. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> is it I, I don't know if I'm spelling it right, but I spell it K A R H I L D A. Okay. I feel like that's how David spelled it, but I might be wrong, but that's certainly how I've been spelling it. But I am dyslexic, so. Oh no, it's all good. I've been mis I've been mispronouncing it then. Cause I you I've noticed like if if I what I was picturing was C A H I L D A. So I was like, oh, Kahilda. But every time uh. you guys say Kahilda, and I'm like, so is that like is that is that the R? Is that is that is that the English R, the non rhotic R? <laughs> and yeah, it was. So her name is actually Carhilda. Yeah. Uh and I have been saying it wrong this entire time. Everybody knew what you meant. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad we were all on the same page. <laughs> Even if mine's from a different uh, edition of the book. Yeah. <laughs> the American version. Yeah. Yes. That's the American uh, spelling. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the fact that like, okay, Car- the name, there was like the initial thing of Gwendolyn saying the name and seeming like, oh yeah, uh, uh, Carhilda Rose. Rose? Uh, Th- uh, Thorn. Th- what? It's double barrel. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, which is like such a thing. Whenever every party I have been in, uh, whenever people adopt fake names, it is an immediate car crash. Uh, <laughs> it's just every single time people will immediately start flubbing the names and it turns into a circus. Uh, so I loved that. But then like, yeah, they're upset. And then it's like, wait, Carhilda's is supposed to go to the desert. 
What? Yeah. It's a culturally dangerous name? Like, yo. It was horrific. Yeah. Yeah. If I was wearing a hat, I'd take it off for you, uh, Grace, by the way. Well yeah. done playing that scene. That that description of you running off and sort of tearing at your clothes and just sort of feeling that need to kind of get out, even though there was no way that you could. Like, you just wanted to get out mm. from being Gwendolyn. Or Gwendolyn wanted to step out of being herself. And I, I felt that was such a well-described moment. It sort of felt like one of those universal experiences. And I thought it was so well-described. And I felt really with you, with Gwen at that point. It was so great. Thank you. I, it was, it, it, it's, I think David does it so wonderfully. Um, and and the whole cast, like, because, as Jeremy was saying at the beginning of this episode, because it's such a supportive cast and we're all really there for each other. It really means that when we get to these vulnerable moments in the story that you do feel supported to like kind of go the whole hog. I think there's certainly like, you know, you could be in other parties where actually I don't feel safe enough to kind of say what I really think is going on that's messy with this character. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be in kind of a safe place where, OK, I'm just going to let this character be a mess because this is just like turning her whole world upside down that like, you know, she'd had this kind of name given to her by these kind of Orcosian holy people at her birth that, that meant all of this, which she had no idea about because she actually, she knows nothing really about her mother's culture and country. Like, I think that's one of the reasons she was so excited to go over and meet the shattered runes because uh, n- not all of the, all of them were from, Orkosh, but like um they were cousins and stuff but so like to actually kind of meet some Orkosians she was excited about that and then it's just like oh maybe this is why I'm not even yeah. there mm-hmm. um so yeah it was yeah it was it was it was it was heavy but it was also without sounding too much like a wanky actor but it was also really cathartic to be able to do that as the character and kind of like explore that so um yeah, that's uh, yeah. just one of the things that makes storytelling with this group so exciting. Mm. And this wasn't even a long episode, but I think it, there was a lot that happened in it, even though maybe not a lot happened plot wise, mm. a lot happened emotionally. Uh, and I mean, David did a great job of sort of stepping back and letting the cast basically have a group moment of like everybody trying to be supportive of Gwendolyn and Gwendolyn going through it. Uh, yeah, it was really great. Really fantastic, I thought. Uh, I, I felt like it reflected interestingly on Gwen's mum, who obviously we don't know very much about, but just the fact that the uh, the mystic orc people... Um, had made this sort of prediction that she was a car Hilda and then her mum had left her away from Orkosia. That that means that she, that's mm. a protection, right? That that she was protecting her. And then by leaving her, it's sort of meaning that there's no attention brought to Gwen, I guess. I mean, that might be a very charitable mm. way of looking at it, but I sort of felt like it did reflect quite well on Gwen's mum. Yeah, I mean, certainly from what Gwendolyn knows of her mum like she kind of just has the romanticized stories Mm. from her dad but to kind of go okay well her mum was basically told this child doesn't deserve to live sort of thing and then she made sure that her daughter would still have an opportunity at life Mm. um yeah i i I do i agree it does kind of show her in a more favorable light whether gwendolyn sees it like that i'm not 100 percent right now well i mean where we are in the story, you've just had it landed on. She's just had it landed on her. Yeah, exactly. She got a process. <laughs> Sorry, I must stop saying you. No, but to be fair, I say me because <laughs> I, I've been living with this character for like three years now. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's going to be the closest I've ever been to any character that I've ever performed before. And this is a character that I've created. And so you, it is, it's so easy to be like, oh yeah. And then I did this because <laughs> it does become really real. Mm-hmm. Like, especially when you're in those moments, like I can see in my mind, all these things that they've done. Like I can see the street and where this happened. Like it's all, it's all in, it's all in the brain. So, mm. so you can say you basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you're playing, I mean, it's often like the DM will say address as you because it's Mm. like, yeah, you're in character. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think it's like the most immersive, like one of the most immersive theater experiences that you can have. (laughs) 
Definitely. Really, is playing D&D. Yeah. Being a whole other person. Oh, and this is something I, I just looking at my notes. I wrote down that there were echoes of the uh, the Will Smith, Why don't he want me, man? Yes. Uh, in that oh scene. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like when Gwen's talking about her mom, I was like, oh, man, Gwen's feeling it. It's rough. I don't think I've seen that. And Juna is Uncle Phil. Oh, yeah, Juna's oh, Uncle Phil. Oh, it's... It's from The Fresh Prince, The Fresh oh, Prince of Bel-Air. Oh, you know I probably will have seen that. I just... It's gone deep into the memory banks. Yeah. It was one of the, I guess, the more serious episodes of the show where mm. Will's dad shows up. And his dad and him, like, never really had much of a relationship. His dad was absent for most of his life. And so he's rocked up. And, like, Will is, like, really excited because he thinks they're finally going to get to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And then I think the dad just vanishes again. Like, or I I think he just straight up leaves. Like, Will might have seen him leave or I think he left. But Will basically, at the end of the episode, is in anguish because he thought he was finally going to get to reconnect, going to get to reconnect with his father. And so he's he looks at Uncle Phil and he's like, why don't he want me, man? And it was like, oh. It's one of those things, like, on, it, it, even though it's in a sitcom, it's like, yeah. it, you, it, that's a w- tough one to, that that one sticks with you, because it feels so mm. honest and genuine, like, yeah, this is just a kid who really wants their parent, and feels a sense of rejection, and doesn't understand why. Yeah. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> yeah. So then, so then Gwen was looking at people and saying, it's okay, I'm just in anguish, <laughs> as they were going by, which I thought that was hilarious as well. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then she got drunk and kissed a bunch of people. Yeah. Including a dude who looks like Enkidu. We got a Gwen T- like a, a Gwen Kidu tease. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. I was just like, the sort of people that like she might want to snog. I was just like, mm, yeah, she probably want to snog this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A I mean, guy that looks like Enkidu. Uh, Enkidu had a dream where he was chatting to a half orc woman who didn't know her name. I mean. Mm. <laughs> and a warrior. Yes, exactly. That's true. Actually, yeah. Maybe he was having tea with Car Hilda. Ah. The original, the OG. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, cool. Yeah. I only just had a thought that. Mm. Somebody messaged David. <laughs> if it wasn't the we, case before, it should be the case idea. now. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Let's fold um, that back into the story. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> So do you think Kyle was a person and then has like tainted all Kyle after her? Because I thought it was sort of maybe a prophecy and the prophecy had become like a boogeyman. Oh, that's interesting. It could be both. Mm. It could have been that there was a Carhilda way back in the day who defended uh the orc people uh or at least the people of Orkosh from some kind of invasion or terrible disaster. And was maybe successful, maybe not, but regardless, there was such hardship and de- death that her name, even though she is a person who tries to stand in the gap against danger, her name became associated with that danger. Like maybe her rise to power, uh, was coincided with that. And maybe there was some sort of prophecy or prediction that another figure like that would arise. Maybe there's even been multiple iterations of this. Oh my god, Kai like Helder is the slayer. And- <gasps> <laughs> oh my Into each god! Generation I love that so much. <laughs> One who will stand against the forces Ooh. of darkness. <laughs> Alice, that is so tasty. Yeah. I yeah. love that idea. Somebody call David. <laughs> Get David on the phone now. I mean, oh. Maybe one day we'll have the... I mean, this has been actually quite a like fun way of doing super fan chats. <laughs> I don't think I've given too much away. No, I haven't. Oh my I'm God, your book yeah. has been so, so good. So maybe you get David on super fan chats at some point. Maybe if this is the new format, who knows? It all depends on when we're free. <laughs> yeah, listeners, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what works. It'll be cool yeah. though. I like hearing your theories live in person and actually being able to, because, you know, like when I'm listening to super fan chats, I'm like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But you guys can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> You've entered the podcast, Chris. Oh You're in gosh. with us now. I am in it. I'll never leave. Never leave. Never leave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I thought that, I thought it was really nice. To, uh, I think it was a cathartic episode for everybody because mm. it had been a while, I think, since we had like a big emotion. There'd been a lot of plot, 
like a yeah. lot of plot uh, and a lot of exploration and intrigue and things like that. But there hadn't we hadn't had a chance for everybody to just be like, hey, we love each other yeah. and we're going to support each other and just and we're going to go kiss a bunch of people. Yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was the right people to be with. I mean, well, it was the wing thrapple, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it's true. And they are the two that Gwendolyn is particularly close to. Like, I think she's close to Orin too. And like, you know, Gwen Kidu are, are trying to make a friendship happen, you know, slowly. I, every time yeah. I think they're going to be friends, they annoy each other again. Uh <laughs> I always think of that as just the dynamic of the friendship. Like, to me, it's like, yeah, y'all are friends. Y'all just fight all the time. (laughs) (laughs) That is just their friendship now. Yeah. They would absolutely lay the line. I feel like they'd lay their lives on the line for each other. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. In a, like in a heartbeat, yeah. They really respect yeah. each other. They just don't. Yeah. And they'd go argue on. about it later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is there is respect there. I think most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of them would nearly sacrifice themselves to save the other, and then they'd have a big argument about it, where they're like, "You didn't have to do that. I was fine." And yeah. It's like, well, but I couldn't tell you. <laughs> no, I yes. saved your life. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But certainly from an emotional level, having Guy and who she began the adventure with and obviously Juna, who's Mm -hmm. been part of her whole life, um, to be with her in that moment. And then she did her favourite thing, go and imbibe lots of stuff. (laughs) Yo, Gwen likes to hit the substances. She does. I mean, she's 20. Away from home the first time. This is is her gap yard. To the max. (laughs) <laughs> on my gavia i saved the kingdom <laughs> yeah she she like she like she likes a drink she likes a bit of frosting um and that is currently one of her main coping mechanisms so that's uh that's fun oh boy this party needs a therapist <laughs> they really do uh do we have any last thoughts uh on this this trio of episodes i just loved um Gaius ending up with Eustace at the end of the episode. That was cute. Yeah, yeah. Especially because, like, the joke at the beginning was like Gwen's flirting. June steps back when Juna starts flirting, and Gaius has got his tongue all down his throat already. And then at the end, it, be- it came true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. I, 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 what What about you guys? Okay. Um. I thought it was a really uh solid trio of episodes. Uh. We had plot development. We had intrigue. We had fun. Uh. We had the the tragic end of the Twain Tide Tea Tournament. Uh. <laughs> but we're picking up the pieces and moving forward. <laughs> and and uh, I'm excited to see where we go from here because it feels like we're at a point where. Once again, the party needs to be like, okay, what's our next goal? Like, it seems like there's a number of things that folks could pursue, but yeah, the question is like, where it, where are they going next? What's the yeah, next plan? It feels like the folk tales, or at least sort of finding a route through story, is kind of the 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 quest now. They've they've mm. they they've set themselves on this quest to find out about the hinges, and that seems to be the key to it. So I guess it's just collating stories, which should be a really fun path, like for us as listeners, certainly, but for them. And it almost like the Carhilda thing feels like it folds into that just because it is essentially a folk tale just from a different country or continent. Yeah. So it, it's part of that, that quest almost sort of we're finding out st- mm. the truth through story. Yeah. yeah. Information we can't find in yeah. a library because it's vocal tradition. Is that the right word? Vocal tradition? Oral. Oral, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Oral. T- <laughs> we- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's totally on theme, really, Alex. Uh, <laughs> I, we've had Bush. I well, left the Bush oral. alone. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for, letting, for letting me come and crash super fan chats. It has been a, it's been oh, a joy. It's been super fun. Uh, please. Super fan fun. Super fan hey. fun. Yeah. Please feel free uh, to leave the jacket here because those aren't cheap and we, we can't afford to just like <laughs> yeah. take them. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Um, I'll just make sure I fold it up nicely. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just brush right. off the crumbs from the biscuits yeah. I've been eating. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> Jeeves will launder it. Great. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll catch you next time for more uh, Superfan Chats. And I forgot the sign-off. What do we say? 
What are we saying? Anon for uh, now. Oh for my now. goodness. <laughs> oh, it's been a while. <laughs> All right, let's give it a one, two, three. One, two, three. Anon, Anon for 